Hello, I'm Mike Molnar, and welcome to my presentation on the history of Westinghouse radio and television manufacturing and broadcasting on the 100th anniversary of KDKA. This good-looking guy is George Westinghouse. He was born in 1846 and 23 years later is awarded his first patent. And it is a major patent for a fail-safe air brake system. His concept was to have a brake system that was normally engaged. The brakes would not release until air pressure generated by the vehicle forces the brakes open. This is a fail-safe system since a failure on the vehicle causes a loss of pressure and the vehicle stops as the brakes engage. This system was the perfect solution for safety problems on railroad cars at the time. Westinghouse quickly forms the Westinghouse Air Brake Company in 1869. Demand for these brakes brings rapid growth for the company. Also, as electric power systems are beginning to get a foothold around the country, Westinghouse decides to enter the field, and he forms the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in 1886. He believes he has a better idea than Edison using alternating current. Westinghouse was the kind of man who didn't mind getting his hands dirty if there was a problem in the factory. He was well respected by his employees and was known for paying a fair salary with excellent benefits. He even built homes for the employees to either rent or buy. Westinghouse companies never suffered the job actions that were typical at that time, and Westinghouse even made the bold move of making Saturdays a half day. Westinghouse's personality allowed him to attract quality associates to help him reach his goals, even men like Nikola Tesla. Westinghouse knew that AC power needed to do more than just light light bulbs. Motors would be needed to run factories and home appliances. Tesla's AC motors would do the job. AC power transmission would require transformers to raise and lower the AC voltage. Westinghouse brought in the man who built the first practical AC transformer, William Stanley Jr. Towns and cities would now be awarding contracts to install electrical systems. Would they pick the DC plan promoted by the well-known inventor of the electric light or the AC system associated with the ethereal Nikola Tesla? Although the public may have seen a battle between the two men, in reality Westinghouse was leading the battle for AC. This is what the headquarters for AC power looked like in 1888. A major battle in what was called the War of the Currents was over the contract to harness the power of Niagara Falls to produce electricity. While AC promised efficient transmission, Edison touted a safer system. As highlighted in this picture taken in 1888, there is good reason to make the best choice for your city. Edison took his safety campaign to the public. When Western Union lineman John Feeks was trapped between live wires, Edison's group told the story of the hours his body lie trapped and burning. Edison does build one AC product that he donates to the state of New York, the electric chair. After many experimental ex electrocutions in West Orange, Edison is ready to prove the danger of AC current. He even offers to name the procedure as having the prisoner Westinghouse. In 1890, the execution of William Kemmler does not prove to be the humane and quick procedure that was promised. It took several attempts until the grisly end, and witnesses commented that it would have been kinder to hack him up with an axe. But the decision is made. Science of AC beats the politics of DC. By 1895, the first major hydroelectric power plant is in operation. These are some of the interior views. This is an overhead view of the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893 called the Columbian Exposition. 
This would be the site of the next battle in the War of the Currents. Westinghouse and General Electric both bid for the contract to provide electricity and lighting for the fair. Quite a project for 1893. Anxious to get the public relations boost, Westinghouse undercuts General Electric's bid by 50%. General Electric, which was formerly Edison Electric and Edison General Electric, doesn't take this very lightly. In the past, Edison had never enforced his patent rights on the incandescent lamp. Westinghouse and others were allowed to build and sell lamps since it helped build the demand for power stations. But now, Edison and GE would try to stop Westinghouse from lighting the fair. Not to be defeated, Westinghouse found a way around the Edison patent, which specifies a filament in a vacuum in a permanently sealed bulb. Westinghouse patented a stopper bulb, where the glass was open at the bottom and the vacuum was maintained by a temporary stopper seal built into the base. And the stopper bulb works. The fair is lit in grand style. This view compares a day and night look at the same area. This was another inspiring view for visitors who likely didn't even have electricity at home. This interior view shows a Westinghouse and a GE display located next to each other in the hall. To continue the work to electrify America, Westinghouse has to increase his debt. The East Pittsburgh plant grows. Other facilities are opened in Newark, New Jersey, New York City, Cleveland, Ohio, and Bridgeport, Connecticut. The factories are large and very busy. This postcard shows just a small testing area on the floor. George Westinghouse may have won the Battle of the Currents, but he loses the war. In the financial panic of 1907, Westinghouse loses control of the company to financial interests. He dies in 1914 but in his life was credited with 361 patents and having created 60 companies. Around the same time period, Edison also loses control of General Electric and states that he is finished with the electric business. World War I brought many government contracts to Westinghouse, including a contract to produce over a million rifles to be sent to the Tsar of Russia. New England Westinghouse was created to fill the many orders for the government. Factories were purchased and refitted in East Springfield, Massachusetts and Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. War contracts also introduced Westinghouse Electric to the field of wireless communications. Fortunately, a young Westinghouse engineer, Frank Conrad, is already knowledgeable in this field. Three models of receivers were built by Westinghouse, a Model RB commercial receiver, and the model SE 1414 aircraft receiver, as well as a model SE 1012A receiver. These two receivers with the SE designation were designed by the Navy's Bureau of Steam Engineering, but built by Westinghouse. All three models were built at the Westinghouse Newark, New Jersey works. The transmitter construction and large government contracts were done in East Pittsburgh. This is an early picture of the Westinghouse Newark Works, which was at the time primarily used to make incandescent lamps. As the war ends and government contracts are completed, Westinghouse tries to find a place for itself in the radio field. As large companies often do, Westinghouse tries to jump ahead by buying companies such as International Radio Telegraph, which controlled the Nesco company and the patents of radio pioneer Reginald Fessenden. They then option and then later purchase the promising patents of inventor Edwin Armstrong. It's not clear what Westinghouse's purpose was at the time. They were unable to establish a radiogram service since that field was already dominated by Marconi. The amateur field to sell parts was too small but was it just to keep GE from having a monopoly in the field? They had a long-time rivalry. 
Was there any business plan that could produce a profit from radio? Also at the time, Westinghouse radio man Frank Conrad was experimenting with radio and was sending test signals from his amateur station, 8XK, located above his garage. He would place a microphone near a phonograph and send music over the airways. Over time, other amateurs, their friends and relatives caught on to the free music. Conrad's station gained more recognition with an article in QST magazine, a publication for radio fans. This is a picture of the 8XK transmitter circa 1919 that was in that second floor room above the garage. As interest in this free music grew more and more, people wanted to join in. Soon a local entrepreneur caught on and started selling crystal radios and parts at Horns, the local department store. When Westinghouse executive Harry Davis read about the sale of those radios, one of those Westinghouse stopper bulbs must have flashed above his head, because here was an idea. This could be his business plan to make money on radio, produce radio broadcasts to create the demand, and produce radio sets to supply the radio listeners' needs. Not just the dozens of sets like sold at Horns, but tens of thousands of sets all over the country. It would happen, and in just a few years, like this radio store pictured in 1923. A team was put together, and within a several-week period, a broadcast station was built atop the Westinghouse plant. Plans were made to broadcast election returns of the Harding-Cox election on November 2, 1920. They signed on that evening and broadcast returns until the next morning. The complete KDKA broadcast station is pictured in this room. The transmitter and engineer are at the rear. The line to the antenna runs up the back wall. Donald Little and John Frazier from Conrad's group handled the engineering side, and Leo Rosenberg, a Westinghouse public relations man, was at the microphone. Election results came in by phone from the telegraph line at the Pittsburgh Post. By all accounts, the broadcast was a success. Although less than 10,000 people likely heard the broadcast, the enthusiasm was high as friends and neighbors gathered around wireless sets. I don't know if this picture was taken right at that time, but either way, Frank Conrad deserved a good rest. Soon the station was improved and the 100-watt transmitter was replaced with a 500-watt unit. This photo shows the telegraph room where information was received and typed up for the announcers. The transmitter room is at the rear. The receiver on the table is a Westinghouse Model RB. This beautifully colorized image shows the transmitter room. The antenna attachment atop the Westinghouse plant is shown here. Soon a studio setup is put into use. And KDKA becomes a test site for many early radio experiments. Early experiments were conducted in the short wave band, meaning slightly above the current AM band. This set consists of a regenerative tuner and an amplifier. It could be used as a rebroadcast set, receiving a program sent over a long distance and relaying it to a second transmitter. In the early days of radio, the concept of FM, frequency modulation, was known but of no practical use. Frank Conrad, Donald Little, and others were granted patents on systems of narrowband FM. It was hoped that this could fit more broadcasters into the same broadcast band. No workable system was created, but you must wonder, what did those AM radio listeners hear during those 1920s KDKA FM tests? Improvements in the equipment at KDKA continued. This is Frank Conrad at work in the lab in 1928. This photo shows the transmitter building in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, 
circa 1930s. And in the age of the Hindenburg, this advertising balloon must have really gotten people's attention. KDKA hires Harold Arlen, believed to be radio's first paid announcer. The KDKA Orchestra is formed. Celebrities begin to take part in radio programs. Will Rogers made this 1922 appearance on KDKA. Arrangements were made to share news service with the Pittsburgh Post. This chalkboard could show people the day's radio schedule. And Westinghouse began selling the equipment radio fans wanted. It was expensive tuner and amplifier for $130, $1,600 in today's money, plus speaker, tubes, antenna, and batteries were all extra. The tuner and detector amplifier pair at the top were produced in East Pittsburgh. After around 1,400 units were made, production of the identical pieces as seen in the bottom pair were built in East Springfield, Massachusetts. Many thousands of these were made. The Westinghouse factory in East Springfield, Massachusetts that had made rifles in World War I would now be retooled to produce radios. Not long after the decision was made, antenna towers popped up on the factory building. The Westinghouse business plan was being followed. Create demand with radio programs and supply radios to meet the demand of listeners. Of the first 10 general broadcasting stations licensed, four are by Westinghouse, KDKA, WJZ in Newark, WBZ, Springfield, Massachusetts, and KYW in Chicago. This colorized image is the entire station WBZ in the East Springfield Westinghouse factory. This is an early image of WJZ in Newark, New Jersey, located right in the shopping district. WJZ's antennas in 1921. Westinghouse Station KYW in Chicago starts in late 1921. After World War I, the U.S. government, seeing the importance of radio, made moves to create a strong and efficient American-owned radio corporation. For our purposes, we can summarize that RCA was created to be that corporation, and ownership was shared by the major players in radio. These members would be cross-licensed and thus relieved of the legal problem of patent conflicts that could block radio development. The Westinghouse controlled patents and market share bought them entry into the group. Members AT&T and Western Electric would produce transmitters. Receivers would be marketed by RCA, but mostly produced by General Electric and Westinghouse in a 60-40 plan. 60% 60 were supplied by GE and 40% would be supplied by Westinghouse. Under the agreement, Westinghouse continued to build and market these early models, which were in production prior to the agreement. They included the RA and DA, the crystal detector, the small crystal radio, and the one-tube senior. Starting in 1922, under the 60-40 plan, Westinghouse produced these older models and newer models, including the popular Radiola 3 and the Radiola 26 Superhead. This 60-40 plan was hard to manage. If either GE or Westinghouse had the more popular models, RCA would have to juggle the supply to increase orders for the less popular models. That was needed to balance the orders at 60-40. A buyer could be anxious for a certain model, but directed to other models to help RCA meet their requirements. By the later 1920s, the plan had to be changed. Both companies would build all of the models, and RCA would place orders in the 60-40 ratio. If 10,000 Radiola 17s were needed, 6,000 would be ordered from GE, and 4,000 would be ordered from Westinghouse. As the 1920s model years were ending, RCA and David Sarnoff had a unification plan. RCA had bought the Victor Company, and now they had their own production facility. GE and Westinghouse would end radio production. 
and now RCA, GE, and Westinghouse could all market these radios that were made by RCA Victor in Camden. The tag on this Westinghouse radio tells the story. Manufactured for Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company by the RCA Victor Company. This table shows the Westinghouse model radios with the equivalent of RCA Victor model radio from the period 1930 into 1934. Then another change. The U.S. Justice Department sees RCA as a monopoly. In a settlement plan, GE and Westinghouse have to divest their interest in RCA. GE and Westinghouse also are forced into a non-compete period to allow RCA time to grow on its own. Some Westinghouse staff, no longer needed, moves to RCA in Camden, New Jersey. A prize catch for David Sarnoff is Vladimir Zworkin, who will go on to invent the Iconoscope TV camera tube and the Kinescope TV picture tube, all making electronic television possible. So as the non-compete period ends, Westinghouse starts to sell radios again. But there is no clue at where these radios were being made. Then, this curious tag appears on at least one model. Made in USA by D Corp, Detroit. Radio Corporation, General Electric, and Westinghouse licenses. Could D Corp be the Detrola Corporation? Could it be Westinghouse, a pioneer in radio and broadcasting, is now a pioneer in outsourcing? Westinghouse radios were mostly marketed by dealers who would get all of their Westinghouse products at Wesco stores, Westinghouse Electric Supply Company. But curiosity needed to be satisfied. It was time to find out who really was making these Westinghouse radios. The Westinghouse model numbering scheme didn't help. WR100 to 199, ACDC table radios, etc. was not a clue as to who was actually making the radios. But a little research yielded some results. Except for cabinet differences, Emerson produced these Westinghouse models. American Bosch produced this console radio. This cross-reference list shows which Westinghouse sets, 1935 to 1936, were made by either Emerson or Bosch. Then the trail goes cold after 1936. No matches could be found for the period 1937 till radio production stopped for the war in 1942. We can see Westinghouse was producing many sets, but where were they getting them? Then it was discovered that American Bosch stopped producing radios for the home market in 1936. Did they switch to making radios for Westinghouse? The answer was yes, and this was later confirmed by collectors who had relatives that worked in the American Bosch plant. In 1939, television broadcasting begins. Westinghouse presents their line of TV receivers. Westinghouse wants to be part of this next big thing, but is already loaded down with government contracts as where it started in Europe. The answer once again is outsourcing. This table shows the RCA model number and the equivalent Westinghouse model number. They started with a 5-inch screen and went up to a 12-inch screen. This model is equivalent to the RCA TRK-12. It has a slightly simpler cabinet and includes a Westinghouse radio instead of RCA radio. The mirror in the lid design is used due to the length of the early 12-inch picture tubes. This model, equal to the TRK-9, has a direct view 9-inch tube and a Westinghouse radio. Decals and labels on all the sets still read RCA. Now Westinghouse announces that its radio division in Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts, coincidentally close to American Bosch, will be moving to Baltimore, Maryland. Westinghouse purchases the manufacturing plant of the old Miller Safe Company. They announce that they will be producing communication gear for government contracts. 
That was true, but there is also the top secret plan to begin producing radar sets. This is the same model that was stationed near Pearl Harbor. Its accurate warnings were ignored. As the end of the war approaches, Westinghouse announces plans to resume producing commercial products. They purchase and refit a plant in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, not far from Harrisburg. The Sunbury plant is off to a slow start because government contracts are still being filled. But Westinghouse does begin to produce its own radios. When the Home Radio Products Division gets going, their model numbers will be recognized by beginning with the letter H. Other divisions are opened to produce radio and TV tubes, picture tubes, and special purpose tubes. Many of these are located along the southern tier of New York. Westinghouse, an early proponent of FM, begins FM broadcasts at KDKA and producing FM receivers at the factory in Sunbury. FM transmitters are being built and located at high elevations to cover large areas. They would also construct a home at some of these remote sites to house the engineer and his family. This was a site for WFBC-FM in Paris Mountain, South Carolina. To be ready for mass production of television, Westinghouse purchases property in Metuchen, New Jersey, and begins construction of a modern facility. This was to be the Miracle Mile production line. Materials would come in, and televisions would leave by a rail line at the rear of the property. There are other reasons for choosing this location. Metuchen Edison area is within a corridor from New York to Camden to Princeton and Philadelphia that was the Silicon Valley of its time. The availability of materials and skilled labor was certainly a plus for this location. Here is another big reason for the new location. Color TV was coming. Test signals were being sent by RCA from the Empire State Building. This was a good location to test the TV's performance. These models were one of the first color TVs sold to the public. Due to the high price, limited programming, and a small picture, few of these were actually made. It would be a few years before 21-inch color TVs were being produced. However, black and white TV sales were booming as, quote, portable TVs became the second TV in many households. Westinghouse was also an early transistor radio manufacturer. They made most of their own components, including their own transistors, as you can see on the bottom right. This table shows the commercial and government radio divisions of Westinghouse. Starting as early as 1912 with experiments, right up to World War II. This table shows the divisions manufacturing radios and televisions for the home. Starting with the work in East Pittsburgh in 1920, the move to East Springfield, then to Camden, uh, no production during World War II, then starting in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, and finally moving to Metuchen, New Jersey. The division was sold to White Consolidated Industries and became White Westinghouse after that. As time went on and the Westinghouse Corporation grew, the Westinghouse Radio and Television Division moved down the corporate ladder. They were under the Westinghouse Electric Corporation, who was under the Westinghouse Electronic Corp Components, who was under Industries and International Group, and then finally the Westinghouse Corporation. We can see that Westinghouse Radio and Television was just a small part of a giant corporation. By the 1970s, 100 divisions, thousands of products. By the 1980s, annual income passed $10 billion, and the company had 150,000 employees. They had divisions that were just selling furniture to their own offices. Products ranged from light bulbs to nuclear power plants, financial services, media companies, just a giant corporation. So what went wrong? Why aren't we all talking into Westinghouse cell phones today or typing into our Westinghouse PCs? Something must have gone wrong. The nuclear fuel contracts that 
Westinghouse had made in order to sell the Westinghouse nuclear power plants was losing $2 billion a year. The financial services, due to a bad economy, was losing $3 billion. There were so many divisions, it was hard to manage. Foreign competition was getting into many of their product lines, and a big company moved slowly, which had delayed entry into many commercial products. What could be done to stop the fall? Well, maybe new management. Now, that didn't work. Let's try different new management. That didn't work either. Let's try different new management again. That's not working too good. Maybe what we need is a change in direction. So what's the final solution? Since media companies were consistently profitable, let's become a media company. Westinghouse purchases many media companies, including CBS. Westinghouse begins selling off other divisions. Westinghouse forms a division to sell off other divisions. Westinghouse makes it official and changes the company name to CBS. After 111 years, the New York Stock Exchange Westinghouse WX stock symbol is removed. In 2017, the former Metuchen plant was being torn down to make way for an Amazon distribution center. A friend of mine wanted to get me a souvenir. As materials were being crushed for fill, he traded a worker two candy bars for two bricks that are now part of my collection. And they will stay here, guarded 24-7 by Lila, unless somebody brings her two candy bars. Thanks for watching my presentation and my thanks to the people listed above.